Good afternoon and welcome to Remaking the Economy, Economic Justice in Indian Country. I'm Steve Dubb, Senior Editor and Director of our Economic Justice Program at Nonprofit Quarterly and coming to you from Boston on land stewarded by the Massachusetts Nation. Uh, this webinar builds on three articles our panelists wrote for an MPQ series this fall on ways Native communities are organizing for economic justice and sovereignty. Uh, this webinar and the series from which the webinar uh, sprung uh, is a partnership of MPQ with First Nations Development Institute. Um, today, our expert panelists are uh, Heather Fleming uh, from the Navajo Nation, is Executive Director of Change Labs, uh, which is the only uh, business incubator and accelerator on Navajo land. Uh, Jamie Cloche, uh, Navajo White Mountain Apache and Kiowa is here in place of her partner, uh, Vanessa Rowenhorse, um, and also her co-author of the article. Uh, Jamie is co-director of Building an Impact at Native Women Lead. Uh, Lakota Vogel uh, from the Cheyenne River Sioux Nation is CEO of Four Bands Community Loan Fund in a Native CDFI in South Dakota. Um, a few notes before we get started. Uh, first, we're very excited to take your questions and we will leave considerable time uh, for panelists to answer them. Um, please put your questions in the question box at the bottom of the screen. I will share as many of them as I can. Um, second, uh, it's a regular question of whether we will be sharing the slides and recordings after the webinar, and we will. Uh, so you don't have to worry about that. Um, one last thing, uh, the webinar is free, but producing these webinars is not. Um, so if you like what we're doing and can support MPQ's economic justice program, uh, please consider making a donation today. Uh, you can also join the conversation uh, via social media. Our hashtag is rebuild the economy. Um, thanks for joining us and please uh, complete the brief survey after the webinar to inform our work. And with that, let's begin. Um, with Heather, and Heather, can you uh, introduce yourself and talk a little bit about the work of Change Labs? Absolutely. Thank you, Steve. Thank you for having me. Yat e, she Heather Fleming Inishia, and I'm a member of the Navajo Nation and also the executive director of Change Labs in Tuba City, Arizona. Bitan Inishle, Bilagana Bashishin, Todichini Dashache, Do Bilagana Dashanala. I was born in Tuba City, and I grew up, though, in the southeastern edge of the reservation in rural New Mexico. And throughout that time period, I recognized inequity, but I didn't understand it. The home that I grew up in had running water, electricity, but when I visited my aunties and my uncles in Tisnos Pass, we always had to haul in water and rely on kerosene lanterns, you know, when the sun went down. And as a kid, I accepted these differences as fact, and I didn't question why things were the way they were. And it took me a while to start connecting some dots. Despite being a native person who spent the majority of her life on and around the reservation, I fundamentally didn't understand how it all worked. And then I met my co-founder, Jessica Stego in 2013, and she began to educate me on the policies behind the constraints that make life and opportunity on the reservation challenging. And I began to realize as a 35 year old adult, how we as native people play by a completely different set of rules than the rest of the American population. And this is particularly problematic to me in the construct of economic development. So for four years, Jess and I have been collecting anecdotes from Navajo business owners on their biggest challenges. And we started categorizing them and we began to see patterns. You know, if your address isn't federally recognized, you can't easily get an EIN, which then limits your ability to formalize a business. If you can't own the land that your home is built on, you have no collateral to qualify for home or business loans. And according to our research at Change Labs, the Navajo Nation is one of the most difficult places in the world to be an entrepreneur. You know, imagine a startup with no physical capital, no internet no way to list on Yelp or Google Business or no ability to even receive shipments. Combine that with the caustic business regulatory environment on Navajo, and you have a pretty good picture of why you see so few local businesses when you drive across the reservation. Once we had mapped this ecosystem, we could design programs to fill the gaps. So as Steve said, Change Labs runs the only business incubator on the Navajo Nation, the only micro lending program for Navajo and Hopi businesses 
and we're one of the one of two modern workspaces for business owners on Navajo. So I'll wrap up by saying that you know, pulling any one of these levers isn't going to fix the ecosystem. We definitely don't have the luxury of silver bullets. Instead, our challenge at Change Labs is to innovate ways to simultaneously pull each of these levers because that's what's required for progress to be made in our community. I'm very excited for this conversation today and thank you for having me. Thanks, Heather. And uh, Lakota, could you introduce yourself and talk a bit about the work of uh, Four Bands? Yes. Hi, good afternoon, everybody, or to most individuals. Um, my name is Lakota Vogel. As Steve mentioned, I'm the executive director of an organization called Four Bands Community Fund. We're located uh, on the Shine River Sioux Indian Reservation in north central South Dakota. Um, I, like Heather, was born and raised on the reservation and did most of my education off the, you know, outside of South Dakota actually, and returned home with sort of just a fire in my belly to, to make some changes and, and see what I could figure out as well. Some similar realizations as Heather in, in my growing up of um, realizing there's a lot of structural um, barriers for advancing opportunity on the reservation. And I wanted to see if I could fix that. Um, a CDFI is a community development financial institution and we receive that um, moniker from the Department of Treasury. So you can apply and basically you're, you're a revolving loan fund. You request loan capital from various different sources, federal to philanthropic, and then you with the board of directors decide the best use of that, um, those loan funds within your community. And four bands started serving the artist community first. Um, many of our artists were seasonal and weren't able to access capital. And from there we grew to small business loans up to 250,000. And just recently in 2019, we heard from our community, the lack of access for mortgage lending. So we dipped our toe into that space and there's no looking back. Um, we have a pipeline demand of over 20 million just for Shrine River Indian Reservation, which is about the size of Connecticut actually. So geographically, it's a large size reservation um, with a small population, but many, many folks seeking home ownership and our only issue is just being undercapitalized. So lots to talk about with uh, these great panelists today and I'm, I'm happy to be here. Thanks Lakota. Um, and uh, last but not least, uh, Jamie, uh, could you introduce yourself and Talk about Native Women Lead. Sure thing. Hi, everybody. Yat uh, Jamie Gloshe and the Chef Makaida Nanish Lesson Ajane Dasha Che is a Fagai Bashish Chi. I'm Jamie Gloshe. I'm Navajo, White Mount Apache, and Kiowa um, here in the Southwest, uh, residing in Tiwa Territory, um, also known as Albuquerque, New Mexico. Grew up on both the White Mountain and the Navajo um, reservations, and just want to thank Heather and Lakota um, for sharing space and Steve and MPQ for inviting us. Um, my my I guess background comes in in living with a, a single mom and living on the res and kind of seeing and experiencing um, I guess just poverty firsthand. I didn't know we were um, poor at the time because I felt like I had a really great childhood and, and beautiful lands to live and, and play on. And um, it wasn't until I recently did a little bit of money mapping that I was like, oh wow, like we were in survival mode. So a lot of that now informs the work that um, we do at Native Women Lead. We are a grassroots Indigenous-led, Indigenous women-led initiative that started in 2017, really around the question of how do we support um, ourselves, one another, and our community, and what makes Indigenous women entrepreneurs different. And from that, um, we convened our community, just people here in, in, in New Mexico and Albuquerque. And we asked what the challenges and barriers um, are that exist for Indigenous women entrepreneurs and what are the opportunities. And that's essentially how we created our core values. So um, our core values are our BWE values, as we also call them. It acknowledges that Native women are the backbones of community. We're emerging as entrepreneurs and uh, we're weaving not only our community, our culture, our passions, our skill sets to bring about change and empower one another. So those have been our like guideposts as we've evolved as an organization. And in our own um, inquiry, trying to get research about indigenous women entrepreneurs has been incredibly hard, but we've learned that two thirds of us are the breadwinners, the economic stabilizers in our communities, both on and off tribal lands. I also like to say the bread makers. Um, Pay inequity is a huge issue. We make 60 cents to the dollar compared to our uh, non-Hispanic white male counterpart. And um, the violence issues are, are just 
insane. I think four and five of us will experience violence in our lifetime. Um, so we've seen entrepreneurship as a pathway towards safety as well as stability um, for our families and our communities and our nations. And we also learned that um, Indigenous women are growing businesses twice as fast as any of our counterparts. So we saw that as like, wow, okay, here's, here's a pathway, here's something that we can do and how do we support that? So as we've evolved, we're actually doing work in convening our community, research, policy, advocacy. Um, we're designing capital access tools to increase access to capital. Um, and we do a lot of partnership and, and work not only locally as well as nationally and internationally to really think about what it means and why it's important to invest in indigenous women. And how do we do that in a way that um, is done so in a way with care and non-extractive and non-exploitative to our community. Thank you. Thanks, and, and I think I wanna open the discussion up and uh, you know, uh, I'll start with you know, a, a basic question and Jamie actually made this point that the values, the economic values in indigenous communities are often quite different than um, for you know, sort of the standard uh, capitalist values that um, animate the economy in the US. Um, uh, Heather, you wrote about that a little bit. Do you, do you wanna jump in and, and talk about that? Sure. So we, when we interview the entrepreneurs enrolled in our incubator, for example, as they're going through the program and then at the end, um, we're usually probing for, for questions like this where we want to understand things like, you know, we spent all this time on financial education. Why is it that no one has set up their accounting system or, or that no one has um, applied for a loan and asking those sorts of questions kind of uncovers all sorts of nuggets of information. So we have, I would say the majority of entrepreneurs will say something like they feel like they're part of two worlds. There's the white entrepreneurship world and then there's their native world. And they're constantly trying to reconcile these two. Um, even you know the, the white entrepreneurship world values money and scale. Like the point of being in business is, is to make money for yourself or you and your family. Whereas most of the businesses enrolled in our program, they refuse to monitor their finances because fin financials is not their metric for success. Their primary way, the reason that they want to do what they're doing is because they're trying to solve some sort of problem in the community. Um, and they, some of them don't even want to know if they're making money at all because they don't want to be accused of greed. They don't want to be accused of of, um, of taking wealth from the community. So there, <laughs> there's so many things to unpack there about what wealth means, what success means, um, and how a lot of the, the beliefs that we have as Native people are, are counter to how we define success as Americans. And I know that Lakota and Jamie have a lot to say about this too, so I'm gonna pause there for a second. Yeah, either of you should jump in, it's fine. Um, sorry, I'll jump in, Jamie, if that's okay. Um, yeah, very similar situation. Also, Heather up here um, on Shine River, we did a promotion kind of last, a few years ago in 2015 to try to like align with social entrepreneurship principles because we hear a lot of our um, Native entrepreneurs using similar stories about why they want to start a business. And usually it's um, noticing something in their community that's missing or not there and Kind of tired of people saying somebody somebody should do something about this instead we're seeing the entrepreneurs stand up and be i am that somebody right and they're solving some problems within their community so that they can get the the rest of their family and community members access to a good or service and um we do an annual business survey also with all of the loans that we do to try to track revenue because that's generally what we measure success on especially funders require that of us a lot and getting those completed is also difficult but um, we always have to sort of, you know, being in the middle seat like we are, Heather and Jamie, of talking to entrepreneurs, you can sort of um, break down that translation barrier between, you know, entrepreneurship and what the rest of the world wants to see, and, and it usually works, right? So there's value to the roles that we all play. I would say we, we did also ask questions about what wealth means to elders within our community, and a lot of the terminology is around, um, it's, there's more value to circulate versus accumulate. Right. So um, wealth and what you accrue should be circulated and it should be given 
four times over generally for a Lakota values. And um, there isn't a lot of value in accumulating wealth, holding on to it. Um, and actually there are structures in place that limit us from valuing um, assets in that way, whether we like it or not. So I'll, I can stop there for Jamie to jump in. Yeah. Thanks so much. Go Go ahead. Yeah. No, I just want to echo all of that. I, you know, what we're seeing and what we know, I think innately is that um, a lot of our worldviews aren't about the me, it's about the we. And I think that really um, changes how folks look at the world um, when you're looking not just out for yourself, but you're looking out for your family, your community, your nation, your tribe, the, the relationships that you have, um, Mother Earth, uh, the animals, the, the natural resources you steward, you have a whole different level of responsibility and other um, beings and entities and things to think about and consider beyond yourself. So what we've seen as well with entrepreneurs in our community, a lot of them are social entrepreneurs, they're looking to solve a problem, they're motivated by the passion, skill set, interest, not looking to be extractive or exploitative of people and planet. Um, and one more thing I would also say is very different is there's this um, rootedness and reciprocity of, of giving back, like it's actually a blessing to be able to give. Um, and, and models are definitely mirrored very much around the natural world. Um, so like the, you know, the cyclical economy, we look at things such as water cycles and uh, natural resources and seasonal things that, that, that we, we mirror and, and emulate because we know that those models actually are, are natural to this world. Great, thanks. Um, so Jamie, I wanted to throw the next question to you. I mean, you actually write about um, the five C's of credit. And so some people on this call are gonna know exactly what the five C's of credit are. Yeah. And some aren't even have, gonna have a clue of what those are. So say, say a little bit about what the five C's of credit are and why that's an impediment um, so often to, to economic development. Thank you. Yeah, so five C's of credit, just background, I used to be a lender at, um, at CDFI. So I actually use the five C's of credit as underwriting to, um, I guess, assess risk or to rate people's ability to get a loan. And I was very naive very early on thinking, oh, I'll go out to my community. I'll go out to Indian country and say, I have money. Like, let's get a loan. Who wants to start a business? And I thought, you know, people be like, yeah, me. No, it didn't happen. There's significant distrust of the financial institutions that be. Um, there's a lot of racism that people experience. There's a lot of predatory lending in tribal communities and tribal lands. So it actually is really hard at times, I thought, to lend to people. And then within the CDFI industry, I had to go to the underwriters or the people that were you know, approving the loans and advocate for my community and really say, this is why I believe in this entrepreneur. This is why I think they'll pay us back. Let's take the risk. Let's give them money so they can grow this business. Um, but traditional underwriting uses like capacity, you know, can they, can they take on the debt capital? Do they have money? And I hate this term because it's often used in the financial systems. Do they have skin in the game? And for me, it just really irks me because it's like, heck yeah, we do. We have our bodies and we have our lands already taken. Like we've already have our ROI there, you know, like where's our return on investment? Um, and then you look at conditions, market conditions, which is really hard to do in Indian country, especially in informal economies. Um, collateral access to capital in Indian country is really hard because, you know, if I lived on the res and I had my house and I own my house, I couldn't just say, OK, I'll put my my house or my mortgage on the line for this loan. Um, a lot of banks don't want to do business in tribal lands because of sovereignty and character and credit is another one. So a lot of our folks, as Heather mentioned before, don't have access to, I hate using this term too, financial literacy, but the, the financial capability, which is the access and the education doesn't meet us where we're at. There's no cultural relevancy. There's no space for historical and systemic oppression. It doesn't recognize that we don't have access to generational wealth or assets, um, that there's racism in financial institutions, that our economies have been disrupted or siloed. And another lens that we're also bringing into the space is now like trauma informed lens. Like there is financial trauma in our communities of people living in poverty, living in survival mode, living in scarcity mode. It definitely affects a person's well being. So we can't hold space and, and create, you know, just go in and assume we're gonna give people money without um, knowing that there's all of this nuance and complexity. Um, so that's why I think the five C's is actually really problematic. Um, and doesn't hold space for all of those things in the current financial system. 
And you did ask like, what's an alternative, right? Yeah, <laughs> so yeah, please, please. <laughs> So um, in learning all of this, you know, and seeing what our community has said is really problematic is we're trying to design capital access tools that hold space for all of this. So we're looking at holistic models that incorporate not only TA, the money, the training, the community, um, the care to really hold and uplift autonomy and sovereignty for Indigenous women that we serve in our community. Um, so we're actually saying that from the design of capital tools, Indigenous women or Indigenous people need to be at the forefront of that to inform the design, inform the implementation, even as we look into um, investment, like that whole, I guess, continuum, even in the decision making process. Um, so we're actually looking to design underwriting criteria that is reflective of our values and done with the lens of rematriation. So we're taking the five C's of credit because we say that they don't work. We're flipping that on its tail saying, actually, no, we want to create something different that's actually rooted in relationship. So I'm not going to determine risk of someone's credit score. I'm actually going to think about, you know, how this relationship and trust, um, what, the, what the business is doing in the community, how that actually is a, is a measurement to show that Indigenous women should be invested in and we can be trusted and that we are trying to create change in our communities and truly see us as um, the solutions, the solutions drivers. Great, thanks. Um, anything, uh, Heather, I'll, I'll throw this to you a little bit. I mean, you're on the, the businesses you're working with are trying to work with CDFIs, right? So, you know, how, how does the credit system work or not work for the businesses that you're supporting? I mean, yeah, every, echoing the, everything that Jamie just said, and I should add that the lending program that Change Labs runs, Kinship Lending, is part of a co-op capital program that Jamie and Vanessa built. So our organizations are partners in that way. We're basically piggybacking off of the, the innovation that they have done with partners in New Mexico. Um, shoot, and now I forgot your original question, I'm sorry. What was it again, Steve? Well, I mean, uh, Jamie was just sort of outlining, I mean, I, I assume that the businesses are trying to access CDFI capital and sometimes succeeding, oh. but you know, how is that working or not working? Yeah, actually, I'm glad you asked this because somebody wrote in the chat window or they're asking me um, if Change Labs can access a Native American CDFI. I think they meant Navajo CDFI and I accidentally pushed the wrong button. I meant to type an answer. So we, we have a CDFI on Navajo. Um, I believe it has like a $20 million or something like that, but somebody show me receipts from when they've ever given either a small business loan um, or, <laughs> or any loan really. I'm sure they have. I don't want to bash them too much. There's probably good people there, but they are not reaching the types of entrepreneurs that we serve. So Change Labs is primarily focused on, on the folks who are running their business from their home because they can access the capital, the physical and financial capital to grow. And I, I feel like that's an underlying issue with even with our with kinship lending and co-op capital is we can't have good candidates for loan and un, loans unless people have the infrastructure they need to get out of their home. And by our estimate, the vast majority, like way more than 50% of entrepreneurs are running their business from their home. So there's, to me, there's, it's almost like a chicken and egg, which is why I say you can't just, at least for Change Labs, we can't just focus on one thing. We have to be elevating all of these things at the same time, like tackling land and finding financial solutions, working on the policy environment. And I think that fundamentally makes this work so difficult. I would love it if we could just run a business incubator or just run a loan program, but the environment doesn't allow for it. You have to be doing multiple things or have it multiple partnerships working on everything at the same time because the ecosystem is so weak. Okay, thanks. Um, Lakota, I want to get you back in the conversation and I thought you did, you know, you wrote really uh, interesting piece looking at um, trust lands and how, I mean, that's been referred to already, at, you know, um, and the challenges that poses to uh, collateral and, and finance. Um, so, I mean, 
so talk a little bit about um, what is the trust land system and and why the uh, I think you referred to the the solutions as white paper towels so you can you can tell that story and you know why that doesn't work and what what could work yeah yeah I think that's this is a, a bigger conversation but I think Jamie kind of played on this a little bit and it's about being invited to the table the product development table um, and that's what the whole analogy is about you know as they were designing the um, the soap dispensing tool to be put into you know all the hotel chains they didn't think about the population that it would be serving and that's exactly how our financial system has been set up um, there's frameworks that have been put in place the five C's of credit without input or without thinking about this complicated trust land status so what that is is basically there's several land statuses on reservations, including tribal trust land, which is held in trust by the federal government for individual tribes. And then there are individual trust land. So as an individual citizen of a tribe, I can hold trust land on within the reservation boundaries. And so if I'm seeking home ownership, I, it's, they make it very difficult for me to leverage the land that I'm standing on, the five acres that I'm standing on as collateral for financial institutions. And I, at this point in my 10 year career in financial world, I just feel like the conversation has stopped happening. People have refused to innovate within the space. Um, there's 56 million acres of trust land in the United States. And it's frustrating to me that we've put so many regulations on financial institutions that they are unable to think around this problem. Um, it's literally like, like your brain is a malleable instrument, right? So like even language, there's a certain window of opportunity for you to learn language. I feel like in the financial institutions, you know, at the age of seven, technically, if you're a feral child and you've never been exposed to language, your brain stops being, there's a window that closes and you're unable to actually learn language after the age of seven. I sort of feel like that's what's happened with our financial institutions. Like as we've been colonized and we've rebuilt ourselves into these nations, the window of opportunity has closed for us to co-create financial products with financial institutions for trust land. And I think that was done on purpose, truthfully. Um, I think there's a lot of solutions in this space and it looks like the government coming in and helping out with that, financial institutions and corporations helping us you know, co-create products and us sitting in these seats um, with the perception, we know our communities, we know how to do this. We've got these great tools here. We know how to reach our populations. We just need the capital to come our way and we can get you what you need. It's kind of like, nobody likes the person that says the fake problem exists. <laughs> um, instead, you know, white institutions have sought narratives which confirm their anxieties exist, which is risk. They've confirmed, you know, that there's risk within our markets because we don't fit their framework of the five C's. And it's just a constant narrative that's repeated over and over. And um, we're standing up as leaders within our spaces saying there's a different way to look at our world and our markets. And there's lots of opportunity here. You're just missing out on it. Yeah, um, really powerful and thank you. Um, I would just um, maybe give like um, Lakota, given you, you talk about this a little bit, like your own CDFI, at least at, 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 within your communities, is, is making some of those fixes. So can you talk a little bit about what those are? You know, Jamie covered some, we actually were also frustrated with the five C's of credit. So we did a regression analysis on 105 of our small business loans to think, okay, if it's, if everybody tells us collateral is gonna mitigate risk and equity is gonna mitigate risk and skin in the game, is it really? And so when we looked back at 105 of our loans and looked at those factors and how we rated them, the things that mitigated risk were these things we've talked about. What was the relationship? How did we, as members of the community, judge the relationship with the borrower? How did we judge their character within their community? Because we know them, we know how they're working within their community and how, did, how was their credit score? So um, unfortunately, credit score showed up. We understand that that can be a limiting barrier, but we've been working in our community for 20 years to build credit scores. So we feel like that has been a, a true measure of, um, and mitigating risk for us. But those three factors bubbled up to the top as the big, biggest factors to mitigate risk, not collateral, not, not equity. So actually what we do is we don't rate those as high. And if somebody doesn't bring equity to the table, 
we go out and fundraise so that we can find them equity, right? So if you're looking to do a lawn mowing business and you need an extra $10,000, we'll purchase you a lawn mower for $10,000 so that it builds out the borrower's balance sheet. This is also a little bit of um, helping with the colonization process. Like a lot of people don't have wealth that's accumulated throughout their family history. So it's good to do that for them and that builds their balance sheet and makes them a stronger business moving forward. We also don't wanna hurt anybody with our debt. We also agree that there's trauma <laughs> within lending and our whole focus is to make sure we don't do debt to income ratios. Instead we do um, expense to income ratios. So we make sure that we're, our loan won't, our loan payment won't force a family to not make their grocery payment, right? So we look at all the bills within the household, go through the budget with them and say, um, yeah, you, you don't have an extra $150 to make this loan payment right now. What can we do to shift that and change it? So those are just two examples of how we, um, have changed the framework a little bit. Um, and those are very easy accommodations to make. Great, thanks. Um, Heather, I think I'll throw it to you. you. You guys are working with businesses. So talk about, you know, what is, you know, where, where there's some of the business successes that you've had and, and what's, what are the factors behind that? Well, one of our successes I would say is, is pretty recent or one that I love the most. I just posted this on our Facebook page. Um, so two members of our alumni network, they're both 2019 graduates, um, have recently just found a way to collaborate. So one runs a rural grocery in Hard Rock, Arizona, and the other is a Navajo chef. He makes the most fabulous Navajo sushi you'll ever eat in your life better than you can find in any urban area. And he used to run out of um, like a food truck outside the Chevron station in Tuba City. So he partnered up with the grocery store owner so that he could provide some prepackaged foods for her to sell in her extremely rural community. But then they took the collaboration a step further. They partnered with two of our 2020 alumni, two of the farmers in our community, Chigi Farms and Coffee Pot Farms. And now those two are supplying the produce to the chef to make fresh foods for the rural markets. But I mean, this is the exact sort of thing that we wanna see happening. Surprisingly, there isn't a ton of collaboration happening, at least in our community. And I think it's primarily just the lack of infrastructure, the lack of resources, the, the lack of, of peer networks, really. Despite the fact that so many people are running businesses there's not like a support system or a, a way for them to, um, uh, to, to talk about collaboration or stimulate ideas. And I just think it's so awesome that these four have found a way to build a system that benefits all of them and expands markets for all of them. And that's exactly the sort of success or the sorts of things that we want to be facilitating and fostering. Great, thanks. Um... Jamie, do you want to jump in with some of the, the work of, of co-op capital? Yeah. <clears throat> so uh, this is just, you know, one, I guess, the thread line in the work that we're doing with Access to Capital is really testing relationship-based lending, not dependent on the five C's. And what we're seeing is we have less than a 1% default rate. Uh, people's credit scores are increasing. Uh, people are actually increasing access to capital through traditional methods now. So some of our borrowers because the credit union, which is Nusenda, can look at their payment history with us, they actually underwrite based on that. Like, oh, they have positive payment history, so let's look at a business loan. So they've actually increased their access to capital. Um, and with our borrowers, we've actually uh, woven loan forgiveness to make it kind of integrated capital. And it's actually um, supported entrepreneurs to pay off faster. So 25% of the borrowers we work with in Native Women Lead have actually paid off their loan entirely within the past 18 months. And this is as a response it within COVID, within COVID times. So we're looking to now grow um, those loan funds. So we're gonna have not only the microfinance, the mezzanine funding, and then larger funding, which is a big $10 million raise coming up. Um, but you know, we're trying to prove right now, we're still in pilot mode, trying to prove that indigenous women are investable and should be invested in. And a lot of the successes we're seeing, we're actually seeing, we have an entrepreneur that we work with here in New Mexico that um, is actually doing plant-based indigenous food catering. And she's actually got an investment now. So now she has a home office. Um, but that was also a really hard 
kind of journey to witness her go through as we talk to investors with her and to see how even with Jedi minded like investors, it was actually very problematic, um, exploitative, exploitative and extractive um, for this person. But luckily she's who she is and she is, she's a fierce person to work with and um, she was able to land that investment. And, and I'm, we're also seeing, you know, just really neat culturally woven um, businesses. Like there's a woman who does Kojo yoga, you know, like taking like Navajo philosophy and yoga, uh, a woman who is creating an indigenous women's birthing center. Um, another one who wants to do like uh, environmentally eco-friendly, sustainable laundromat because her community doesn't actually have access to a laundromat, especially in times of COVID. Um, and as we know, Shyla Sh Shepherd here in New Mexico, one of the first indigenous women brewers in the country. So we're seeing all these different types of um, businesses pop up and they're definitely reflective of where these um, people live and, and the needs are very different both off and on tribal lands. Um, so it's really neat to see just how um, women are approaching business and, and we also try to hold space for all that they carry as caretakers, as caregivers, as mothers, as economic stabilizers, um, as community leaders, and then holding space for, for what they want to do in their future as they self-determine their path towards economic agency and empowerment and freedom. Thank you. Great, thanks. Um, so I think I'm gonna go to the audience questions. There's quite a few, uh, thank you. Um, you know, one question that comes up a couple different ways is about, um, you know, native men and, and native men as entrepreneurs. Um, I assume you guys work with native men. So, but, you know, talk about that or is it is it concentrated, you know, in, in among women in terms of, of entrepreneurship? I'll just, uh, say right now we have a very specific gender lens approach and it's really woven in our matrilineal lens and um we like to say and we we recognize that we're 100 um, percent reflective of the community we serve um that doesn't say that we don't work with indigenous men but um right now in our early inception of our work it's specifically gender lens focus at this point right no i, I get that with with native women lead um <laughs> but um i don't know uh Lakota, uh, I'm sure the, the, in terms of borrowers, is, is, it, is a trend? Like, would you say mostly entrepreneurship is, is uh, women-led or is it mixed or how, how, what does it look like? I see Heather came on too. Um, I Ours is, yeah, ours are always is in the 60% to 52% native women entrepreneurship. Um, and, you know, I, a lot of the men that do it are very similar to sort of like the economies we have here, our agriculture and very rural. So we have a lot of truckers. We've got a lot of um, ranch owners that are co-owners, co, um, right? So you've got the wife and the husband on there. But um, I guess I, I don't really want to hypothesize on to why that's happening. I mean, a lot of that it is about there's other jobs available for men within the anchor institutions there um, that we, you know, exist within our economy. But a lot of ours are you know, 60% women within our small business loans as well. So Heather? Similar to you, Lakota, we're about 51% women for people enrolled in our programs, loans and business incubator. Median age is about 36. And it's, I mean, think, I think when we started Change Labs, we, we, had, we had a sense of who our demographic might be. And then it totally, we kind of learned along the way who the actual entrepreneurs were who were ready to do certain things. Um, and it skewed a little bit later in life than we thought, but definitely, despite the fact that Change Labs has an almost all-female leadership team, there are fabulous men on our team and men enrolled in our programs. Thanks. Um, uh, another question that came up, uh, which I think is kind of interesting, it was some. It's by um, uh, somebody who's managing a uh, white woman is managing a small business grants program, and she's wondering, you know, is the best way to make investments, to work through tribal governments? Are there other ways? You know, I know that's tricky. Um, so just thought I'd see if there were any thoughts on that. Yeah, I actually think that tribal governments are busy uh, responding to a lot of different of the themes. So it's best if you do find nonprofit organizations working within, you know, the space. And I think any one of um, the CDFIs you could reach out to or the nonprofits like Heather's and Jamie's within that region. That, that's my suggestion. What do you guys think? I agree. I'll add that. So with the, the CARES funding that the Navajo Nation 
received, they created um, a Navajo small business and artisan relief grant. And it was the first time that the tribe had ever offered grants to businesses. So if that's what you want to support, I think you're probably better off in the hands of entrepreneurship support organizations, native led 501c3s, just like Lakota said, we just have more experience doing that. And we have more, we have deeper connections in the small business community. Yeah, I echo all of that. And uh, just adding community led solutions that are being done at the community level. There's a lot of um, community led solutions that aren't C3s or are fiscally sponsored, but you know, they're doing phenomenal work, especially in response to COVID and in response to um, on the ground work as well. Great. Um, another question that came up was about uh, scale. Um, obviously, uh, a number of uh, tribal nations, that the population is small, so that can make it difficult. Um, what are what are strategies to to work around that? I'm excited about Coop Capital because we're actually seeing scale nationally as people are getting um, more used to this idea of relationship character based lending. Uh, we actually have a pilot coming up with Community Credit Lab and Common Future, where we'll actually lend $250,000 to Indigenous women. And then as we move forward, we're looking at the $10 million raise, um, but we're still in pilot phase. I would love to see tribes actually think about implementing this um, and thinking about how public-private partnerships as well as tribal dollars could actually scale any of this work to support their local economies and individual entrepreneurs in their communities and off tribal lands as well. I have trouble reconciling with scale, frankly. In my last industry, everything was about scale, 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 and I feel so over it. But I, it's, it's because I'm not doing something like Jamie's doing. I think what Jamie and Vanessa are up to is, is like a perfect example of that. And for Change Labs, our ambitions are a little bit less, like we would be, we would be over the moon if we could just get if we could just cross Navajo, which is about the size of West Virginia. And I think that's more or less where our ambitions stop only because, because um, I can't presume that the challenges that we're dealing with on Navajo are gonna be the same in other native communities. We've talked about um, you know, how Change Labs works with, with peer organizations. Um, and actually we were working, collaborating with Native Women Lead, New Mexico Community Capital, Native Community Capital, our organizations have a formal partnership to try and think about how we take our more or less place-based work and use it to build some sort of network across the Southwest. I think there's plenty of opportunity for that and thinking about that in terms of scale. But beyond that, so our businesses aren't always interested in scale. And until we get, and Change Labs itself, I think we're, we have like a, our blinders on for, for Navajo just because the challenges are so intrinsic and so deep, but I'm curious to hear what Lakota thinks. Yeah, I, I think um, it's, it's sort of something that we always have to face and we've all thought about ways to answer that question depending on who the funder is that asks it. <laughs> and I think that, um, you know, a lot of it is just about, we, we find what we're uniquely capable and good at, right? And for us currently, we did a lot of studies on that is, is a um, entrepreneur development course for reservation-based economies, right? Or supporting that, but we don't wanna do it in a way of I reach out to the individual entrepreneurs. We wanna do it in a peer-to-peer way where I build the capacities of those sister organizations working within those markets, because we truly believe that's what's going to get us to economies of scale is if you can replicate certain uniquely um, good things you're capable of within different markets, but that it's not one monopoly organization, because there are very unique things happening within that community that only individuals from that community can understand. So um, I think we do it. We do it in a lot of different ways, but we also support like a regional coalition. So a lot of us combine and support, like I'm a part of a Mountain Plains regional coalition, just so we could yell really loud and hopefully not be triaged to the bottom and say, look, we're, we're, we're the Mountain Plains region. We're not just Cheyenne River and please hear us. Um, we're still out here. We're still needing resources. So we, we have ways of doing it. And I think um, Indian country is really good about, um, you know, linking arms up when needed. And we're, we're very good about um, um, we're not super territorial, uh, but we do share resources very well and collaborate very well. So that's often what we do when we have to reach economies of scale as we collaborate with our partners within probably regional areas. Great. So, um, so this isn't a, a 
question of, of soliciting investments, but we got a question about, you know, uh, and I'm, I'm guessing, so the, the question is, you know, how, do, how does one invest in, say, native CDFIs, for example, and, you know, I assume there are, are available uh, notes that you can do at low interest rates, but um, is that through OISTA? Is that directly? How, how does that work? I'll be quick. It's directly. Uh, we take, we have individual investors all the time, and then it's usually negotiable. So we have different products with different interest rates. So depending on what the investor's interest is, we can align that with the specific product that we're relending to, and then you could negotiate on the return on investment or what the profit margin is. So we all have, I have an investment application on, I, on my website and I'm sure Heather and Jamie do as well, so. Great, um, thanks. Um, so um, uh, let's see. Well, this is interesting. Uh, this is something I've looked at in a different context. So there's a question about, does anyone see um, member govern like cooperative uh, support organizations on the back end? Or is that kind of what, that may be kind of what Change Labs does. I'm not sure, but um, yeah, anyway. So I'll just uh, share that in a lot of the social enterprises that we're seeing that people are actually looking at cooperatives. Um, you know, looking at shared power, shared power building and um, governance models uh, within our framework, as far as the uh, matriarch funds, we're looking, we really are inspired by Buen Vivir, their fund, because it actually, um, the decision making process and the government governance models within that framework actually um, puts power into the hands of the people in the community and um, puts the burden and the risk actually on the, the wealth holders. So it's really interesting to kind of flip that. Um, I would also say that in our just typical design of the work that we do, we, we are definitely community led. So a lot of the input that we get from community, we actually use it to design in, in all of the things that we do, whether it's programming, convening, et cetera. Um, but our community has actually really informed us about these capital tool products. So there's, you know, even in underwriting, we asked them like, what would make underwriting successful and people are saying community credibility, uh, those that are, you know, problem solving, um, people that have uh, reciprocity woven in, like they're committed to giving back in some way. And I think this roots back to traditional trade and barter systems that we've seen. So I don't know, it's sorry that I'm going all over, but yeah, I'm definitely seeing an interest in our communities as far as um, those types of models. For whatever reason, it hasn't taken off on Navajo. And I, I, it's an interesting question because um, prior to Change Labs, I used to run an organization, an international development design firm. And most of our work was in East Africa and India, where there was co-ops galore. I mean, so many co-ops, I couldn't believe it. Everything was like an artisan co-op or, you know, a women's co-op. But for whatever reason on Navajo, we just don't, we don't, you don't see a lot of that. I think I feel like there's a growing interest in it, but um, I actually think it would be a fantastic model for some of our artisans, some of our agriculture workers and farmers. And I think some there's some leaders, especially in ag, who are just starting to lay the groundwork for, for cooperative models across Navajo, but it's not, <laughs> you'd think that there would be more of it, but at least in our community, there's, there's very little, I think I can only think of one on, on the top of my head. Thanks. Um, let's see, another audience question here. Um, this questioner is wondering if there are any resources that outline how you're shifting underwriting. Like, is there anything systematized or online or that, that can be shared with the community? And I know relationship-based makes it, you know, based on relationships, so not unaware of that. Yeah, I, I'm willing to share our analysis and how we underwrite. And um, if anybody wants a copy of it, I guess my email is at the end of the slides here. But I guess it's not been produced or published anywhere other than just my organization. Yeah, we're happy to share and partner. And, um, you know, a lot of the work that we do locally and regionally, we hope that it informs work nationally and internationally. Um, on our website, nativewomenly.org. We have our event reports with, with our learnings from our community. 
Um, and then we also will be putting up our Equality Can't Wait perspectives so that folks can look at how we're viewing ecosystem work for Indigenous women entrepreneurs and how it actually is very um, reflective of the water cycle. So we're our, our goal is to essentially take that model, um, build a water cycle, not a pipeline of investable Indigenous women entrepreneurs and, and really ensure that the water cycle is healthy. So happy to share that and um, we can follow up with that later. I like that analogy, Jamie, that's cool. Um, Steve, real quick, I just wanna, and I want Jamie and Heather to jump in here too, but I, I do wanna address something that's come up in one of the private chat areas, but it's about um, using land as collateral. Trust land can be collateralized. So anybody that's saying it cannot be needs to be corrected. We currently, it's called the TSR. You just don't go through your county level when you collateralize it, you go through the Bureau of Indian Affairs and their realty office. You can, as a mortgager, be listed on the title status report, you know, four bands, comma, can mortgage and hold, you know, be notified if that's going to be sold. You just have to, you know, record it with a federal agency called the Bureau of Indian Affairs instead of the county. The best practice there is to record it in both locations, however, because if you have a title company and they come and research a plat of land on the reservation, they're only going to look at county level data and they won't go to the Bureau of Indian Affairs. So that's the complication of the two structures or the two entities that you know control land. That's why it's best to record it at the county as well. And you will face county people who say, we, we don't record non-taxable land at the county. And you say, yes, you do. You're a library. You're supposed to record all land trans transactions. And that's what this is for. So there's these are the structural barriers that we have to overcome as we're trying to collateralize a very complicated trust land status. And it's not always easy. You face different realty people. But there's people and faces that often work in those positions that become the barriers that we all have to overcome. Um, let's see. Um, another question that comes up is about um, CARES funding. I knew that would come up eventually. <laughs> so, or American Rescue Plan, you know, the whole different, all the different coronavirus relief funding. Um, you know, clearly some people are getting that funding and other people aren't. Um, and, you know, uh, are there strategies that you've been involved in that you've seen successful that, you know, they able you to access some of the money that's been allocated at the federal level? I'll say that, um at least for with CARES funding, the Navajo Nation, <laughs> it was a little bit of a debacle, but the they did, I mentioned earlier that they offered their very first grant program for business owners and for artisans. They were able to get out or approve, I wanna say, oh, I've seen the, the analysis. Um, it's like 20 million, I wanna say, in grants to business owners and, and artisans. And it was about, um, 6,000 or so people who applied. And despite the setbacks that I won't get into, um, it was the first, the first documentation, I think in history of the number of businesses actually operating on Navajo. So if you look at the registration numbers for at the chapter level or at the Navajo Nation level, I think they were saying that there was like 400 businesses on the entire Navajo Nation, and yet more than 6,000 started an application for this relief grant. And that's why I say that we are positive that the majority of business owners are um, sole proprietors who aren't registered, who are not paying taxes, who are running their business from their home. Um, because there's no incentive for them to, to formally register. There's no incentive for them to, to pay taxes. That's not coming back to them in terms of infrastructure, whether that's physical capital, broadband, um, new financial tools, it's not coming back to them. There's no incentive for them to participate in the economy. The grant program was the first time I feel like the Navajo Nation government has ever offered any type of I guess it was limited to a financial solution, but a financial solution for our business owners. And I know that with 
the ARPA funds, um, Navajo Nation has nearly 2 billion, which is unfathomable. Like that also is something that's never happened in history, but there's, there's a scramble at this moment to, to, um, not just reopen the relief grant program for businesses and artisans, but also to use this as an opportunity to build out that infrastructure, to think about um, capacity, like like expansion of entities like Change Labs and boosting the Diné Chamber of Commerce. And it's a huge opportunity. And I really hope that three years from now, we're looking back at it as a positive experience, but it's too early to say. Okay, thanks. Yeah, we um, haven't seen anything for yeah. for us as a C3, but also with the community we serve, um, it's been incredibly hard. There's definitely a disconnect in their own tribal communities about supporting individual entrepreneurs um, as it relates to the, the support that tribal enterprises get. Um, so we, we haven't really, a lot of people actually turn to us because they didn't have any infrastructure in place when COVID hit to actually just support their base, their businesses to survive and support their livelihoods. Just, I just wanted to mention real quick, Steve, there, there are a lot of other federal opportunities like the Economic Development Administration just has their you know, $3 billion uh, Build Back Better challenge where a lot of us could come in as regional clusters and apply for a $25 million to $100 million grant as C3s within those nations. We can do that and Four Bands is doing that with our regional cluster and that application is due next week. Um, there's also USDA who's got a lot of technical assistance available to support the agricultural communities, um, including there's an heirs relending program that can help resolve some of these title land issues. So I think that's the hard part is we've got to be in tune with every department of the government right now as 501c3s pushing economic development within our community so that we can access these dollars or support the tribal planning department or one of the other entities on the reservation to pull down these funds because it's all coming in a big rush and we're all not quite ready for it yet, you know, and we're trying to move as fast as we can, but um, it, it's, it's hard. It's overwhelming, honestly, <laughs> but it's a, it's a great moment. It's a great moment to be a, you know, a part of this organization and lead this because this is a once in a lifetime opportunity, most likely. All right, thanks. Um, I wanted to ask, you know, uh, obviously we have a lot of people on this call who are, you know, work in nonprofits, some in philanthropy. Um, what steps can nonprofits and philanthropy outside of Indian country do to support uh, Native American leaders? I think uplift Native led orgs. Um, I, I see a lot of nonprofits that do not have Native representation or leadership. Um, oftentimes want to do work in Indian country without that cultural and historical and contents and con context. So definitely working and partnering and honoring the work that native led initiatives are doing. I'm going to echo that. That was going to be my go-to as well. I think there's the limited funding that is going to native communities is maybe going through the wrong hands. And there's so many native led initiatives. They're just facing all of these challenges that we've talked about. So it's difficult for them to be visible. It's difficult for them to be, you know, part of conversations like this. So you have to put in the work to find them, um, but they are definitely there. And then the other one I would add is, um, <laughs> is just to educate yourself. I think Native Women Lead spoke to this really well in their article, but to educate yourself on, on these issues, on trauma, um, because, <laughs> Um, I, I just, I'm, I'm done with, with native organizations being expected to comply with these values and systems that don't resonate with the way that we do work. And I, I think that's a change in philanthropy that needs to be, that needs to happen. Lakota? Yeah, I think that philanthropy, um, uh, just basically needs to, I heard a guy say, um, instead of seizing trying to seize the moment, just let the moment seize you and let go and invest and send your capital our way. We, we definitely know, you know, ways to use it and we have track records to prove it. So that's my advice. <laughs> okay. Well, um, I want to like wrap up because we are at the hour. I know we could go for another hour. Uh, we tried to get to as many of your questions as possible. Uh, there will be 
follow up emails with links to articles and the slides and um, and the recording. Um, but uh, many thanks to uh, Heather Fleming from uh, Change Labs, uh, Jamie Gloshe from Native Wave and Lead, uh, Lakota Vogel from Poor Bands Community Fund. Um, and let's see if we can go to the last slide. Uh, you can see there, we can put on their emails now. I know some of you want to be able to reach out to folks. Um, and also, uh, just to mention, I, I think we'll we'll put a link in the chat. Um, but um, if um, uh, if you can, um, we're going to have our next webinar on Wednesday, November 10th on uh, levers for system change. So be looking out for information on that as well. And uh, there's still uh, one more article in the uh, article series that's gonna come out next Wednesday. And of course, this is only the start of an ongoing uh, conversation. So uh, thanks so much to uh, all of our participants and to everyone that, in the uh, call who uh, commented through the question box. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.